Want to speed up your language learning? Get access to all of our best PDF cheat sheets for free. Just click the link in the description and sign up for your free lifetime account right now. Hi everybody, welcome back to Ask Alicia, the weekly series where you ask me questions and I answer them. Maybe. Let's get to your first question this week. First question this week comes from P. Kasi Viswadnaham. I hope I said your name correctly. P. Kasi says, please explain how to make poetry, Alicia. Very nice question. Okay, poetry. So, we have a couple of different types of poetry that we can talk about. The most basic form that we learn usually when we are very little kids in school is about creating lines of text, creating sentences that have the same sound at the end. So this is called a rhyme in English. So for example, words that rhyme in English would be for example something like bake and cake, right? Or snake and make and take. All of these have the same ending sound, right? The ending syllable has the same sound in all of these words. So we say these words rhyme. So when we're very, very little kids, we learn to make very simple poems by creating short sentences that rhyme. So that means the end of the sentence has the same sound as the end of the next sentence. So here's a very, very basic example of what it sounds like when the ends of the sentences that we put in our poems rhyme. So, I heard you like cake. How about we bake? What would you like to make? So in these three lines, we have the ending sounds that all rhyme, right? We have cake and bake and make. So this is the simplest form of a rhyme. We make short lines or short sentences that have the same sound at the end of them. So this is, as I said, the simplest way to create a poem. So you can start here if you've never created a poem before. But then as you get more advanced and as you start reading more and more things, a lot of poets, so poet means person who writes poems, a lot of poets go outside side of this kind of general rhyming frame. So we see this kind of rhyming style of song making and poem making in popular culture a lot today. And that's very, very common and very, very popular. There's no problem with it. But if you read poetry from English authors, you'll notice that there are a lot of different rules that they apply. So the rules that more advanced poets and advanced authors use include considering the syllables, which means the beats of the words that are used in the lines. They have specific numbers of syllables that they use in lines, for example. This is a different kind of poetry rule. You might also read poets that use very, very strong imagery. So they choose to talk about maybe topics like love, or they talk about topics like war, and they use very strong images of those things to talk about the very like challenging experiences or the joyous experiences of life. On the other hand, you might have poets that use very, very abstract imagery. You might read something and you think, what is this person talking about? <laughs> and it's actually a poem about love. So depending on the poet, depending on the writer, they may use very strong imagery. Or when I said abstract, that means it's very hard to understand exactly what it's saying. So these are kind of very different from the very basic rules that we use in a lot of popular media today. But these are also very, very popular, especially among people who appreciate literature and and poetry and writing. So these, as I said, are more advanced ways of writing poems, but generally the topics that people cover are those specific life challenges or the specific kind of high and low points of life. People talk about those and express themselves through their writing. And so they choose different words and different rhythms and so on to express these things. So in sum, if you want to get started with poetry and you're okay to just start with the super basics, which is great, all kids in US schools, I think, start with making poems that rhyme. You can start there. And if you want to look at more advanced topics, you can try Google searching for a few uh, very, very famous poets and also search for analysis of those different poems that you find. That will give you a really, really good idea of the different ways that people write poems and choose their vocabulary words, what was happening in the world at the time, and so on. So this is a super quick introduction to poetry, but I hope that this answers your question and I hope that you enjoy creating poetry for yourself. Okay, thanks very much for sending this question along. Let's move on to our next question. Next question comes from Spring. Hi, Spring. Spring says, hi, I'm Spring from Vietnam. Hello. I would like to ask you a question. Here's the context. Okay, 
My friend and I went to the supermarket and forgot to take the key from our motorbike lock. Luckily, it was still there after we were done shopping. I told her we were lucky that no one stole the motorcycle. She quickly replied to me that nobody came to take it. But the supermarket doesn't have any barriers, so it would probably have been easy for the thief to do it. In this case, is it grammatically correct for me to say, oh, you're so innocent, or should I say, oh, you are naive? I think that maybe she doesn't have much experience in life and is not thinking this thing through. I hope that you take a look at my question. Thank you so much. Yeah, really interesting question. So the key question here is really, what's the difference between innocent and naive, right? So someone who is innocent is someone who doesn't have very much knowledge about the world and it's not their fault. We often say children are innocent. They don't have life experience, they don't know very much about the world, and they just are learning things as they go, right? So someone who is innocent doesn't know those things, and that's okay. But on the other hand, someone who is naive is someone who is probably old enough to have some life experience, to know some things about the world, and to understand the ways that the world works. So if I were you, if I were in this situation, it sounds like naive is maybe the better vocabulary choice. However, using the word naive to describe somebody, especially to them directly, it can sound really insulting because you're saying you're old enough to know better, right? You're saying that like your life experience should have taught you this by now, why don't you know this? So it can sound kind of insulting to call someone naive. If I were in your situation and I wanted to express this, I might say something like, oh, you really want to see the good in people, right? But there are so many thefts that happen here, we really want to take care. So that expression, oh, I know that you really want to see the good in people, means that you try to think about people in the best possible way, even if that's not always true, right? So this is the difference between innocent and naive, but just be careful. If you call someone naive directly to their face, you might upset them. Okay, so let's take a look at just a couple more examples of the different ways that we can use these words so that you get an idea of how they're actually used. Let's start by talking about innocent. So earlier I mentioned that we often say that children are innocent, right? They don't have a lot of like life experience or world experience. But we can also use this in situations where someone doesn't have the specific kind of of information required to make the right decision. So let's say that there's somebody who works at a really big company. And there are lots of different departments. There's A and B and C and D and there's a bunch of them. So let's say that some guy who works in department B has to work with someone from department F, okay? And they each have different rules in the places where they work. So this guy, B, goes to F and says, hey, I need to file this report. And F says, great, okay, please do that right away. And so B does it and there's a mistake in it. And F gets really, really angry. And it's like, why is this not done correctly? And F's coworkers might go, ah, oh, he's innocent. B guy is innocent. He doesn't know. B has different rules for filing reports than we do in department F. So this is a situation in which just the type of knowledge is different. In this situation, we might say, he's innocent. Don't worry about it. It's just a different policy or a different way of doing something. So we can also use the word innocent to talk about situations in which someone's life knowledge or just like their job knowledge as well doesn't quite match with the other person's. And it's not any fault. It's not a problem. But we just want to point out that's not something to get mad at that person about. We just want to say, he's innocent. It's okay. He did it according to his rules, according to what he knows. Let's fix the problem another way. So we tend to use innocent more when we're talking about kids and very young people that don't have a lot of life experience. You may hear it in like a job situation like this. Someone may use it from time to time, but probably in the situation I described with all of the different departments, you would probably hear somebody say like, oh, he just did it the way he knows how or something like that. But you may hear someone say, oh, he's innocent or oh, she's innocent, to mean that person has nothing to do with the problem or they didn't do it on purpose or something like that. So this is how we use innocent and we use naive as well, as I said before, to describe people who should be able to know the way the world works or should have a little bit of knowledge or information but don't. As I said before, we typically don't use this word when we're saying this to someone directly. We typically use it to talk about someone else. Like, mm, there's a new hire at the company but she seems a little bit naive. I noticed that she doesn't know this, this, and this. So you typically use it to talk about somebody else. We typically don't say, you're naive, or I think you're really naive. It sounds quite aggressive and quite direct. 
Okay, great. So those are the differences between the word innocent and naive. I hope this long answer helped you understand the differences between them and also gave you another expression that you can use when you're speaking directly to someone about their life and world experience. So thanks very much for sending this interesting situation and question along. All right, let's move on to our next question. Next question comes from Bruce. Hi, Bruce. Bruce says, which preposition is appropriate to use before a reservation? For example, I made a reservation under Bruce's name. Is it under or with or by? Nice question. Yeah, generally we say the reservation is under so-and-so's name. So the reservation is under my name or the reservation is under his name. The reservation is under my mom's name, <laughs> whatever. We usually use under to talk about the reservation name. So when you arrive at the hotel, you arrive at the restaurant, you usually say, hello, there's a reservation under Alicia. Or you might also say, hello, there's a reservation for Alicia. When we arrive there, when we talk about making the reservation, however, we use under. So I would say, I made a reservation under my name, or I made the reservation under Alicia. We don't use with, we don't use by, we don't use for. I'll come back to for in a second because we use for in a different way. But let's talk about the other options that you presented. With, in particular, I want to talk about. If you use with to talk about a reservation, if you say something like, I made a reservation with your name, it sounds suspicious. It sounds like you created a reservation using my name. And I might think, why? <laughs> why did you make the reservation using my name? Why didn't you use your name? So generally, when you say, I made a reservation with his name or with your name or with that name, it's going to sound a little bit suspicious. And the reason for this is that the person making the reservation could use their name, right? So when you use with, it's going to sound a little bit suspicious. So please keep in mind that using with tends to sound a little bit suspicious. Even if, for example, your boss says to you, hey, can you please make a reservation at this restaurant? Please use my name. When you get that permission from your boss to do that, and then you make the reservation, it still sounds better to say under. The reservation is under your name, or I made the reservation under your name. You don't really use with in this case as well. It sounds most natural to use under to do that. The next preposition you suggested was by. We do not use by in any way in this kind of pattern, so you don't have to worry about by. <laughs> the same thing goes for to. We don't use to to talk about making a reservation. I made a reservation to her or to me. Nope, don't use it. Don't worry about it. But I want to talk about for. We do sometimes use the word for when we want to talk about making a reservation not for ourselves. It's not my reservation, in other words. When we want to make a reservation, and the reservation is a different person's reservation. Great, so I hope that this answered your question. Please make sure to use under someone's name when you make a reservation from now on. Thanks so much for sending your question along. All right, that is everything that I have for this week. Thank you, as always, for sending me your awesome questions. Please remember to send them to me at EnglishClass101.com slash ask hyphen Alicia. There is also a link for this in the YouTube description. So please send me your questions to the official question submission page. I will definitely read your question if you send it there. I will probably not be able to read your question if you send it somewhere else. There are way too many YouTube and Facebook and social media comments. So please, please, please make sure to send me your questions at the official question submission page where I will definitely check it out. All right, if you enjoyed this lesson, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. Also, check us out at EnglishClass101.com for some other things that can help you with your English studies. Thanks very much for watching this week's episode of Ask Alicia, and I will see you again next time. Bye!